uh, I can just urge my colleagues to stop and consider the very important, um, the very important nature of this legislation as it pertains uh, to the protection of our personal information. Now, are there some things in this bill that I could support and that others in this House should be supporting? Of course there are, Mr. Speaker. The bill that's presented in the House today allows us to have a conversation about the future of Canada's privacy protection and other technological advances such as those found in artificial intelligence, which is the next great breakthrough and will challenge us as lawmakers in this place to keep up with the technological advances and all of the good and bad that comes from artificial artificial intelligence. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Speaker, the EU's 2016 General Data Protection Regulations, otherwise known as the GDPR, is the gold standard for this type of regulation, and I hope that despite some of our differences in this place, and there, there are many, we can at least agree to strengthen the privacy protections for Canadians, Mr. I'm going to interrupt the Honourable Member again. Order! If I can have your attention, please. Okay, very good, the Honourable Member for Red Deer Lacombe. Please continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is the last time I ever accept a speaking slot before the budget from uh, from the Whip's office. Uh, let, let me just say that. So, um, But uh, all kidding aside, uh, we need to trace back the history of this bill. Canada's original di digital, digital charter was mapped out in 2019. That's what I, I referenced the fact that this is a redo of something that we just did a few years ago. And one of its primary principles uh, was the control and consent of one's personal information as well as transparency. These are the most salient uh, parts of that charter. It also attempted to back them by a regime of enforcement. And very good, and he has two minutes and 19 seconds left. In all fairness, I'm going to arbitrarily make a decision. He has five minutes remaining when he comes back, if he wants to continue. <laughs> it being 4 p.m., the House will now proceed to the consideration of Ways and Means Proceedings Number 10 concerning the budget presentation. <laughs> Orders of the day. Government orders, study of a Ways and Means motion on budgetary policy. Ms. Freeland, seconded by Mr. Boissonneau, moves that the House approve the general budgetary policy of the government. Finance. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 83-1, I'd like to table in both official languages the 2023 budget documents, including notices of ways and means motions. Details of the measures are contained in these documents. Pursuant to Standing Order 83-2, I'm requesting that an order of the day be designated for consideration of these motions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Canada's economy has made a remarkable recovery from the COVID recession. Last year, Canada delivered the strongest economic growth in the G7. There are 830,000 more Canadians working today than when COVID first hit. <laughs> We have recovered 126% of the jobs that were lost in those first months, compared to just 114% in the United States. When we announced a Canada-wide system of affordable early learning and childcare in our 2021 budget, we said that it would create new economic opportunities for mothers all across Canada and thus 
greater prosperity for all of us. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? It worked. I am so proud to say that last month, the labor force participation rate for Canadian women in their prime working years hit a record high of 85 points. economic policy, Mr. Speaker. It works. So today, Mr. Speaker, there are more Canadians with good jobs than ever before. Putin et la pandémie. Putin and the pandemic have driven up inflation all over the world. The central banks reacted by launching one of the swiftest and most synchronized cycles of monetary tightening since the 1980s. And today, in Canada, inflation is going down. The inflation rate has been dropping for eight months in a row, sitting at 5.2% in February. The Bank of Canada expects it to fall to just 2.6% by the end of the year. In February, Canadians' average hourly wages rose by 5.4%, so paychecks grew by more than inflation. This means Canadians from coast to coast have more money in their pocket at the end of the workday. However, we all know our more vulnerable friends and neighbors are still suffering from higher prices. That's why our budget contains targeted temporary relief from the effects of inflation for those who need it. For 11 million Canadians and Canadian families, the new grocery rebate will help offset higher prices without fueling inflation. Because what all Canadians want right now is for inflation to keep going down and interest rates along with it. That's why the budget I've tabled today will enable Canada to remain the country with the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7. We are seeing to it that the wealthiest Canadians and large corporations pay their fair share of tax so that we can keep taxes lower for middle-class families and invest in our health care system and our social safety net. Canada is a country of peace, order, and good government. We have strong institutions and a resilient financial system that is the envy of the world. Our country has a proud tradition of fiscal responsibility. That is a tradition we are determined to uphold. We are refocusing government spending while taking great care not to reduce the services and direct support that Canadians rely on. By exercising fiscal restraint, we're ensuring that we can continue to invest in Canadians and in the Canadian economy for years to come, just as we have done since 2015. Because we know that investments in Canadians are also investments in our economy. This is what the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, has referred to as modern supply-side economics. Nous investissons dans le logement. We're investing in housing because our economy is built on people and people need a roof over their head. 
we are investing so that Canadian workers can acquire the skills they need and get to where the jobs are. We're investing to strengthen the immigration system. And we're bringing a record number of skilled workers to Canada to support our booming businesses. And we're investing in affordable child care. From coast to coast to coast, so that more Canadians no longer have to choose between family and career. Investing in housing, skills, and immigration and child care isn't just social policy, it's economic policy too, Mr. Speaker. The same thing goes for health care. So today, we are delivering the overall investment of $198 billion in our public health care system, which the Prime Minister announced just last month. helping every single Canadian find a family doctor, to tackling the unacceptable backlog of surgeries, to combating the opioid crisis that has devastated so many of our families and our communities, that has taken so many lives. We will ensure that Canadians receive the care they need. We will ensure that every single Canadian can rely on a world-class, publicly funded, universal health care system, one that is deserving of its place at the very heart of what it means to be Canadian. Just as we are reinforcing the public health care system we have today, we are also expanding its reach. Since December, our investments have helped more than 240,000 Canadian children receive the dental care they need. Just Bravo. Just think about that, 240,000 Canadian kids Maybe their parents couldn't take them to the dentist before. Maybe their teeth hurt. Maybe they missed days at school. It's so important. And that's why today I am so proud to announce the creation of a new Canadian dental care plan. This year, by the end of 2023, we will begin rolling out a dental care plan that will eventually cover up to 9 million uninsured Canadians. This, yeah. this will mean that no Canadian ever again will need to choose between taking care of their teeth and paying the bills at the end of the month. It will mean you can't tell the size of someone's paycheck by their smile. These are significant and necessary investments, Mr. Speaker, because a strong and effective public health care system is essential for a strong and healthy Canadian workforce. And we need a strong and healthy Canadian workforce now, more than ever. Because as we wrestle inflation to the ground, Canada must also navigate two fundamental shifts in the global economy. First, 
in what is the most significant economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. Our friends and partners around the world, chief among them the United States, are investing heavily to build clean economies and the net zero industries of tomorrow. At the same time, Putin and the pandemic have cruelly revealed to the world's democracies the risks of economic reliance on dictatorships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a result, our allies are moving quickly to friendshore their economies and build their critical supply chains through democracies like our own. Together, these two great shifts represent the most significant opportunity for Canadian workers in the lifetime of anyone here today. Including our most senior and respected members of this House. <laughs> now, this is not hyperbole, Mr. Speaker, or mere turn of phrase. When President von der Leyen stood in this House earlier this month, she said that she wants Canada and Europe to join forces for the climate, for our economies, and to end what she called Europe's dangerous dependencies on authoritarian economies. When President Biden stood in this House just last week, he told us that we are at an inflection point in history. He said that we had all learned the hard way that just-in-time global supply chains make us vulnerable. And he urged us to work together to build a shared future where Canada and the United States can anchor the most competitive, prosperous, and resilient economic region in the world. Yep. These are our closest friends, Mr. Speaker. These are our steadfast democratic allies. These are our two greatest trading partners. And like so many of our friends around the world, they need the expertise of Canadian workers, the ingenuity of Canadian businesses, and the resources that Canada has in such fortunate abundance. Aujourd'hui, today, and in the years to come, Canada has to seize this historic moment, this amazing opportunity we have, or else we'll get left behind as the rest of the world's democracies build the clean economy of the 21st century. So, we are going to fight for Canadians and Canadian companies. We will make sure Canada seizes this historic opportunity. We are building a clean electric grid accessible to all Canadians from coast to coast to coast, which will protect the environment and provide Canadians and Canadian companies with clean, affordable electricity. We are making Canada the best place in the world for businesses to invest because their investments revitalize communities and bring prosperity in addition to good careers for Canadians. Canada has free trade deals with two-thirds of the world's economies. We are making Canada a reliable supplier of clean energy to the whole world. And whether it's critical minerals or electric vehicles, we will ensure that Canadian workers 
develop and process these resources and manufacture and sell the products our allies need. We will ensure that unions, which led to the creation of the middle class, remain on a solid footing. And we are helping Canadian workers get the skills they need. When the government of Canada makes purchases of products from other countries, we will ensure those countries give Canadian companies the same access as Canada gives them. So, Mr. Speaker, we are building big things here in Canada from a Volkswagen battery plant in Ontario. <laughs> to the Galaxy lithium mine in Quebec. Yeah, yeah. Yep. To the Trans Mountain expansion in Alberta. Yeah. Terminal in Kitimat, BC. Yep. Our plan means good paying jobs, good careers for everyone everywhere, from our biggest cities to our smallest towns, from Toronto, Ontario to Peace River, Alberta. Yeah. workers building electric vehicles and our bus drivers who drive them, for our skilled tradespeople expanding our clean energy grid and building thousands and thousands of affordable, energy-efficient homes, for our miners and our energy workers powering Canada and the world, for our health care workers and our teachers who make our communities thrive for our farmers and our fishers who feed Canada and the world, for our incredible service workers who are as essential today as ever. For our forestry workers, for our climatologists and for our ecologists, for our engineers who design hydrogen plants and who design small modular reactors. For our computer scientists who have transformed Canada into a global artificial intelligence superpower. For Indigenous peoples building major projects and sharing in the prosperity they create. And for our new generation of small business entrepreneurs dreaming up solutions to the challenges of the 21st century and their hard-working employees providing for their families all across our great country. As I've traveled across Canada over the past year, Mr. Speaker, I have met a lot of incredible, hard-working Canadians. Jeff, an electrician who lives in Etobicoke with his wife, Cheryl, an ICU nurse. They are proud of their jobs and proud of their family, their jobs have made it possible for them to raise. As Jeff said to me, I've got the skills to pay the bills. <laughs> Leonard. I met Leonard. He's a software developer in Quebec City. He codes charging stations, which are used all over the place, from San Diego, California, to Happy Valley Goose Bay in Newfoundland and Labrador. Two young union women, Nicole in Oshawa, who will start her first electrical placement this week. Well done, Nicole. <laughs> and Kayla, first in Edmonton and then again in Calgary. She teaches apprentices to weld. 
And she gave me a couple of lessons, too. <laughs> I've met potash miners and early learning and childhood educators. I've met scientists and innovators and the longshore workers and truckers who keep Canada's economy moving. And all across Canada, I've met people who value the same things. A good career that pays them well doing work they're proud of. The ability to live with dignity, to be who they are, to love who they love, and to be judged on their character rather than what they look like or where they were born. The belief that if they work hard, they can afford to raise their children and launch them into an even more prosperous future. And the conviction, Mr. Speaker, that because they live in Canada, by birth or by choice, every single day represents a new, fresh opportunity. And that is what this budget invests in, the possibility for every single Canadian to share in the remarkable opportunities that Canada provides and in the new era of prosperity that we will build together. The brave people of Ukraine have reminded me, I think they've reminded all of us, that we must never take our freedom and our democracy for granted. We have the power to shape our country's future, and we must always be sure to use it. What a gift it is to call this remarkable country our home. Canada is a land filled with good, hard-working people, people who do big and important things. And it is because of us, the people of Canada, and the big and important things we will do in the months and years to come that I have never been more optimistic about the future of our great country than I am today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments, l'honorable. The honourable member for Megantic l'érable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the budget leads us to ask a lot of questions. In 2015, let's not forget that this government promised to run small, small, small deficits and then return to a balanced budget in just four years, Mr. Speaker. This same prime minister told us that one day the books would balance themselves, Mr. Speaker. This prime minister said that it was time to invest in Canada because interest rates are low and will remain low forever, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Finance today is tabling a budget which is very similar to last year's. In last year's budget, I quote, it says, allow, allow me to be very clear about something, Mr. Speaker. We are absolutely determined to ensure that our debt-to-GDP ratio continues to decrease. Our deficits must continue to decrease, and the debt we take on to ensure that Canadians remain financially solvent will absolutely be repaid. That is our fiscal anchor. 42.4. That was last year's number. Canada has a strong tradition of fiscal responsibility. It's my duty to ensure that that remains the case, and that's what I will do. And their prediction for this year was 43.5. The following year, 43.2. Then, at the next budget, following those announcements, the finance minister 
already went beyond her fiscal anchor. One should never go beyond one's fiscal anchor. So, Mr. Speaker, given everything I've just said, can the Minister for Inflation tell us how Canadians can be expected to believe even a word of this budget? The Honourable Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, we promised that deficits would decrease. And that is what we are demonstrating today. Last year, the deficit was 1.5% of our GDP. This year, the deficit will be 1.4% of our GDP. Also, the deficit last year was 43 billion. This year, the deficit will be 40 billion. Once again, that is a decrease. Mr. Speaker, there is something that I would like to make very clear for Canadians tuning in tonight. Canada has the lowest deficit of all G7 countries. We also have the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio of all G7 countries. Not only do we have the lowest deficit of all G7 countries, it's lower than that of Germany and the United States. We have lower deficits than fellow AAA-rated G7 countries. Our deficit is also lower than that of Australia and that of the Netherlands, other countries with AAA credit ratings. Mr. Speaker, it's important to understand the economic situation of Canada from an international perspective. Our country is strong. We are very, very lucky to be here in Canada. Before we continue, I would like to remind the members that we only have a certain amount of time. Concise as possible and with their questions and their answers so we can get as many questions as possible. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, aeronautics and aerospace are the pride of Quebec. Despite that, though, Canada is the only G7 country with no overall global policy for those industries. There's nothing in this budget, Mr. Speaker, to correct the harmful effect of the luxury tax on aircraft, which is harmful to Quebec. When it comes time to help Ontario, Ottawa is always there for them, but here in this budget, $18.6 billion in subsidies is going to go to oil and gas, Mr. Speaker. Yet there's not a cent, not a penny for aerospace. Why not? The Honourable Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague has asked a few questions. I'll start by addressing the luxury tax. Our government is proud to have instated that luxury tax. In our view, the most wealthy have to pay their fair share. If the party across the way disagrees, they should say so to their voters. Now, as for supporting Quebec's industries, our government has been there for them, we are there for them, and we will always be there for them. Our electricity credit is an excellent one. It is an excellent program. It's excellent for Quebec. Quebec has a global advantage with its green electricity, clean electricity, but Quebec will need more and more electricity. That is the reason why we have announced a major investment in green electricity. If the member across the way disagrees with me, he should talk to Leonard, the software developer I spoke with last week in Quebec City. Leonard works for a company that creates charging stations for electric vehicles, and he supports our program. Questions and comments. Please, the Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the things in the budget worth commending. They're very familiar items to those of us in the NDP caucus here who have called for affordability measures, like another doubling of the GST rebate for a Canada-wide dental insurance plan that's now on the way. 
to real and meaningful labor conditions around federal investments in clean tech to ensure that it's not just companies but workers that actually benefit from the investments that we have to make That's right. to launch ourselves into the new energy economy and meaningful investment for uh, for Indigenous people living in urban, rural, and northern communities that are struggling, as many Canadians are, with the housing market. But I have to say the budget also rightly includes warnings of a coming recession, warnings that we're hearing from private sector economists as well. And we know that when recession hits and unemployment goes up, the program that Canadians depend upon to be able to pay the bills is employment insurance. That's right. In fact, the employment insurance system was so bad it had to be completely overhauled during the pandemic because it couldn't get the job done. And in September of last year, the government let those temporary measures drop. They've been promising EI modernization for the entire seven or eight, depending on who you talk to, years that they've been in government, they haven't delivered. That's right. So why is it that as Canada looks down the barrel of a recession, the government is missing an action on employment insurance reform? Minister of Finance. Um, Mr. Speaker, I would like to start by thanking the member of Elmwood, the member for Elmwood Transcona, for his collaboration and his hard work as we prepared this budget. And I do want to emphasize a couple of the points he made. I am, as I said really, really proud that we are the government that is introducing dental care for every single Canadian. I am glad that we are able to provide support for the most vulnerable Canadians, to provide a grocery rebate. These are people who really need the help, and it is so important that we're able to be there for them. And I really want to emphasize the third point that my colleague made. And this is the labor element of our clean economy tax credits. This is an innovation for Canada. We haven't done it before. But this time, when the government supports economic growth, when the government supports innovative entrepreneurial businesses, we're going to make sure that we are supporting great jobs for working people at the same time. That is so important. And when it comes to EI, Mr. Speaker, let me say this. Our government has always been there for Canadian working people, whether it was during COVID, when we had to put in place emergency measures, or whether it has been in the design, in the innovative design of these tax credits. Now, come what may, in the weeks and months to come, and so far, let me just say, employment is holding up pretty well, even as the economy slows down, but no one has a crystal ball. And so I just want to conclude by assuring every single Canadian listening to us today, we will always be there for every single Canadian, come what may. Resuming debate. There we go. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Inflation made a statement last year. She said, allow me to be very clear, Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely determined to ensure that our debt to GDP ratio continues to decrease. We will make sure of that, Mr. Speaker. Here we are, a year later, that was not accomplished. It's interesting because just a few days ago, she admitted that deficits fuel inflation. Today, she's tabling a budget with $43 billion in additional spending that will be paid for through taxes and taxpayers. Conservatives work for those who work, and that's why we will vote against this inflationary plan, Mr. Speaker. 
focus only a few days ago that deficit spending would spark even more inflation, higher grocery bills, more expensive housing, and other costs for families. And today, she rolls out a bonanza of $43 billion of new inflation, debt, and taxes that will be on the backs of everyday, hard-working Canadians. We set three conditions for our support in this budget. One, that it bring home lower prices by eliminating the inflationary carbon tax and deficits. Two, that it bring home powerful paychecks with lower taxes that reward hard work. And three, that it bring homes that our young people can afford by removing gatekeepers to speed up building. None of these three, th three, these three demands have been met. All that they have delivered is more debt, more inflation, and more costs on the, be on the backs of the hardworking and beleaguered people of this country. And that is why Conservatives are proud to announce we will be voting against yeah. this inflationary stand. The, the gross cost of all the new spending announcements in this budget works out to $4,300 for every single family in Canada. That's almost enough to house the Prime Minister in the hotel room for one night. <laughs> That's how expensive this government has become. The war on work continues. The inflationary polit policies intensify. Canadians who are living in desperation, skipping meals, living in parents' basements, unable to drive to work, falling into depression and even considering suicide because they cannot afford the pressure and the bills that this Prime Minister has imposed after eight long years. This budget makes all of those pressures, all of those pains and all of those costs even worse. Ce budget rendra encore. This budget will make costs, pressure and difficulties even harder for each family. That is why we will be voting against this budget and we will present our own approach an approach based on common sense, Mr. Speaker. Common sense, which recognizes everyday Canadians who do their work and who pay their bills. The people who work hard, pay their taxes, and play by the rules. We want to bring home a nation that works for the people who do the work. Bring home lower prices, bring home powerful paychecks, bring homes people can afford. It's the common sense of the common people united for our common home your home, my home, our home. Let's bring it home, Mr. Speaker. I now move to adjourn. Yeah.